Shabbat Shalom and welcome to a new teaching in a new season as we've just entered the month of September, the month of the Hebrew New Year. And brothers and sisters, as you would know from scripture, it is the Lord who dictates times and seasons. And the subject that the Lord has asked me to present to you is one which is very uncommon. I don't think in all my years of being in a church, this subject has been approached or spoken about. But it, it seems to me in the spirit that this is something that has disturbed the courts of heaven. And the Lord really impressed upon me to speak on this matter, to educate the body of Christ. And the research I did was astounding to find that there's so much of research that's out there about what's taking place in the global body of Christ. So welcome to a teaching subject called necromancy, the practice of witchcraft in the church. This is a subject which many are unaware of in these contemporary times and might even elude the listener as this terminology might seem unfamiliar to most. So what does this word mean? Necromancy. It is a supposed practice of communicating with the dead, especially in order to predict the future. After my last teaching on Kingdom Citizenship, I was very much surprised when the Lord impressed upon me many a time in a matter of hours to speak to the assembly of how, how far this subject has been neglected and has become so central in many a gathering that the worship of the Most High God has lost its place due to necromancers who are in fact witches and warlocks, postulating themselves as pastors, prophets and apostles, and are seducing the flock with signs and wonders, which are not by any chance false, just like Janin and Jamborees, who were Pharaoh's necromancers, who were able to replicate the miracles of Moses in Egypt as they were also those who consulted the dead, who were in fact the familiar spirits, not the spirits of the dead, but demons in its reality. One must ponder on the question of why the Lord spoke to Moses on this very subject to warn the Israelites of this realm of demons as well as over 100 scriptures that start from Leviticus to the book of Revelation, warning the believer not to go the way of Cain, who opposed the word of the Lord that would threaten their walk and fellowship with God himself. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verses 10 to 11, the word of God said, there shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or daughter as an offering, anyone who practice divination, a soothsayer, or an ogre, or a sorcerer, or a charmer, or a medium, or a wizard, or a necromancer. So basically, in Deuteronomy 18, 10 to 11, the Lord covers the gamut of witchcraft in its entirety, telling us that this is the occult, this is from the kingdom of darkness which controls the world, and if we are in him, the last thing one should do is to walk in those ways. Leviticus 19.31 Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards, to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. 
is again a warning from the Lord, especially to the Israelites who were those first that the Lord spoke to, warning them that their entire spiritual walk can go in a form of disarray because they are seeking things that are not after God. However, the classic explanation and scriptural evidence comes from 1 Samuel 28, 9 to 15. And the woman said unto him, now this is a passage that speaks about the witch of Endor and Israel's first king, Saul. Behold, thou knowest what Saul had done, how he had cut off those that have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land, whereof then layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die? And Saul swear by her, by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this. Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? Speaking of using necromancy to speak to the dead. And he said, that is King Saul, Bring me up Samuel, who was the prophet of Israel. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried out a loud voice. And the woman spake to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul, the king himself. And the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth, in short. She tapped into the realm of the demons and saw them coming out from different parts of the darkness. And he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am so distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God is departed from me, and has answered me no more, neither by the prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called thee, that thou may know unto me what I should do. I will conclude part one here, brothers and sisters, but I think looking at Deuteronomy, Leviticus, and then Samuel, this is a picture of the world today, a world where individuals of the highest rank to the lowest rank are seeking answers from demons rather than the Holy Spirit because they desire to know the future when they should put their trust in the Lord. Isaiah 46, 8 to 10 says, I am Yahweh, knowing the end from the beginning. Ponder on this, Lord, brothers and sisters. If the Lord says, I know the end from the beginning, why do we not have the faith to put our trust in Him for our today and tomorrow? Why seek familiar spirits who are really demons? Because all they will do is take you to a path away from the Lord, which is to hell and destruction. I conclude part one here, and part two will follow shortly. Welcome to part two, necromancy, witchcraft, the practice of witchcraft in the church. The more we dig deeper into this study, the more we get thrown back to the Garden of Eden, where deception took place, as that is what the first law of mention for those who are into Hebrew studies proves to be true, time and time again. The word, the English word necromancy, comes out of the Greek language, which comes via the Hebrew 
and in Hebrew there are two words daras mut daras mut meaning to seek to consult to inquire require or search that is what daras means and the second word mut means dead so daras mut means to seek consult inquire require or search for an answer from the dead an enchanter is one who seeks this demonic connection and the hebrew word nahas comes into play for an enchanter if you look at this word nahas it really means to hiss whisper a magic spell to prognosticate observe signs practice fortune telling so if one were to study the epistemology of the greek word necromancy it comes via the latin necromantia and the word is formed by two greek words necros which means the dead and mantia which means body so if you put these two words necros and mantia you get the word necromantia which means divination through consultation therefore necromancy is the practice of magic involving communicating with what the general public believe is with the dead by summoning up their spirits as apparitions or visions for the purpose of divination imparting the means to foretell the future events and discover hidden knowledge sometimes characterized as death magic the term is occasionally also used in a more general sense to refer to black magic juju which is a word used in africa or witchcraft in the west as a whole another word that comes out of the ancient text is oracle a revelation information gained through witchcraft so if we now revert to the original hebrew words daras to inquire and mut the dead the person who involves themselves in this manner is referred to as a nahas which goes right back to the devil who in the hebrew language tempted eve and is referred to as the nakash the whisperer the original word has nothing to do with a snake but the transliterators examined this word nakash whisperer and said it sounds like a hissing sound which nakash does infer and said therefore it's only serpents that hiss that's how you had the entrance of the serpent which is not scriptural at all there was no serpent in genesis it was the nakash the shining one who whispers that is the direct hebrew translation every act recorded be good or bad is there in scripture and in order to trace the origins of divination and necromancy we have to dive back to the garden of eden where the prophecy from the lord said this genesis 3:15 and i will put enmity between thee and the woman between thy seed and her seed now immediately this should pull up a red flag as it begs the question how does the seed of the devil which is a spirit come to contend with mankind in the future after all the nakash is a spirit from the spiritual realm the answer comes from genesis 6 it says the sons of god the bene ha elohim who copulated with the daughters of men producing gigante that's the greek word or nephilim which is the hebrew word which means the earth born these two terms refer to angelic forces that took on human bodies in order to copulate with women and produce children 
these hybrids were a part of celestial and part human. But they faced one major problem. They carried not the spirit of their first fallen parents, Adam and Eve, but one outside the plan of God. Therefore, as they perished over a period of time, and as their huge 40 to 60 feet bodies went into the earth, their spirits would occupy the territory of the earth's realm until their final judgment in the lake of fire and would be termed to this date as demons or demon in the Greek or spirits without form that continue to seek a body to occupy which is commonly referred to as spirit possession. The prophet Isaiah had this to say about the demons and their future. Isaiah 26 verse 14 They are dead. They shall not live. They are deceased. They shall not rise. Therefore, hast thou visited and destroyed them and made all their memory to perish? The psalmist says in Psalm 82, verse 1, Elohim standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the Elohim. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said, ye are gods, O Elohim, and all of you are children of the Most High. But ye shall die like men, and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shall inherit all nations. Here the psalmist refers to the Lord judging the fallen sons of God or Bela Elohim in Hebrew, whom he set above the nations to guide them, but fell into perdition, as mentioned in Deuteronomy 32.8, a mandate of separating the nations into 70 post the period of Babel. So what we have to understand is Deuteronomy 32 is talking about a period post Babel where Elohim or Yahweh separated the nations into 70. But what he did was he said Israel is my portion. Every other area of this world today is guided or operated by demonic fallen forces who are fallen angels and that is where Ephesians 6 speaks about the principalities, the powers of darkness. I will conclude part 2 here and part 3 will follow shortly. Welcome to part 3. We concluded part 2 where I presented to you from Deuteronomy 32 where the Lord separated the nations into 70 areas, placed angels over them who subsequently have fallen and now are referred to as the demonic realm. But in that the Lord clearly said that Israel is his portion and he's responsible for that. Moving forward, let's look at 1 John 4, 1 to 3. Beloved, believe not every spirit but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Yeshua is Hamashiach, is come in the flesh, is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Yeshua is come in the flesh, is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, Therefore you have heard that it should come and even now is already in the world. So here brothers and sisters, John the Apostle is clearly telling us that even at that time the spirit of Antichrist was in people through demons. By the mentioned scriptures 
we must be convinced that what is in the world are demons as witnessed by the Lord in the place called the Gadarenes. Because when he asked the possessed man, what is your name? The response was shocking. What came out of that man was this statement, we are a legion. Brothers and sisters, this number can vary between 4,500 to 5,000 in just one man. That's how many demons were inside this man. With much said and the provision of forensic scriptural evidence, let us examine the impact of necromancy that is rampant in the church, which covers mainline to neo-charismatic, where these demonic forces operate. Let us begin on false doctrine, which leads one to deception, thereby creating a channel of influence that would take control of the individual, which over a period of time moves all reliance from the blood covenant of Messiah, the guidance of the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit, as the intercessor for all, to a new dependency of a familiar spirit or demon that poses off as a departed saint, a biblical character, but is in fact a demon who is seeking a body to possess and destroy eventually. So let's look at some of the areas where this is taking place. The first, the reliance on external attachments such as medals, amulets, bracelets, scapulars, chanted threads, reliance on prayer beads that promise a connectivity to the divine realm of God himself, but in its reality opens up to the demonic realm of deceit and spiritual deception. Secondly, praying to the dead that includes mummified bodies that are considered sleeping saints. The word of God says this, know ye that Yeshua by the Holy Spirit, the Ruach Kadesh, is the mediator between God and man and not some dead saint. 1 Timothy 2.5 For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Yeshua HaMashiach. There is no other path to God. John 14.6 period. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father except through me. So if anybody tells you that you can pray to a dead saint or whatever, please remember that they are taking you in the way of Cain, nothing else. Thirdly, idolatry, man-made statues, worship, collecting, Parading all forms of idolatry is an abomination to the Lord. Exodus 20 verse 4 Thou shall not make unto thee any graven image, an idol, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, that is in the earth beneath, or that is used in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I am the Lord, I am God, a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto a third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commands. Fourth, the false doctrine called Marianism. The false doctrine of Mary as the matrix of all grace that replaces the Ruach HaKadosh as the intercessor between God and man. Moreover, the acceptance of a man who postulates himself as the vicar of Messiah on earth, who is infallible, according to Pope Pius IX, who stated this in 1870, that whatever a Pope says, he is infallible. In fact, he is actually speaking the word of God, although it contradicts the word of God. There is no scripture to back either of these claims. 
simply because we have a high priest in heaven, Yeshua the Messiah, according to Hebrews chapter 9. Which makes one wonder why these findings were never found in the scripture, nor made to know by the apostles, by the Lord himself, and all doctrine, as Paul writing to Timothy said, is God prayed and revealed by the Ruach HaKadosh. Let's look at 2 Timothy 3.16. That's exactly what 2 Timothy 3.16 says. There are many more areas of contradiction to scripture, but let's leave the multitude of their apostate doctrines aside as key areas of their falsehood have just been exposed and dealt with. I'll finish part three here and part four will begin shortly. Welcome to part four. In part three, I presented to you what the mainline churches are involved with in the practice of necromancy through false doctrine. In part four, the second examination of necromancy that is rampant in what is called the free church or commonly called the born again church. We will study this and find out where individuals who claim to be apostles and prophets rather than teachers and pastors of the word. Deuteronomy 18 verses 20 to 22. But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. This statement clearly gives us a lot of room to visualize that what these people are doing is speaking through demons referred to as other gods by the Lord. And if thou say in thy heart, how shall we know the word that the Lord has spoken and not spoken? When a prophet seeketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord had not spoken. But the pro prophet that has spoken it presumptuously shall not be afraid of him. Remember, all false prophets has to do is to speak one prophecy that does not come to pass, proving that they are false. That's basically what Deuteronomy 18, 20-22 exposes. The general thinking of who is a prophet seems far from the truth, as most folk that seek a prophet in a church environment is seeking one with the foreknowledge of that individual's future in the secular rather than the instant revelation by the Ruach HaKadosh about the Word of God and the ministry that the church is involved in and should be. The book of Acts reflects some very appropriate instances where the gift of prophecy was enacted as well as where through prophetic instruction those in necromancy were exposed. According to the Apostle Paul, there is a certain gift known as the gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy is a special ability to speak forth the message of God. A prophet is basically a spokesman of God. He or she delivers a word to people by means of direct revelation. Prophetic utterances can deal with certain individuals, the church as a body, or in the larger context of the ministry and the congregation. It does not always refer to the future. The word used far more is to proclaim the word of God and clarify it, rather than to predict the future of an individual, especially in terms of prosperity, as those that practice these sayings are in fact consultation with demons. The gift is mentioned more than any other spiritual gifts by Paul. We find it referred to in Romans 
1 Corinthians 12, 28, 29, Corinthians 13, 1 to 3 and 8, 1 Corinthians 14, 6, in Ephesians 4, 11. Although the New Testament does not arrange the spiritual gifts in any order of priority, the gift of prophecy is near the top list for reasons of edification of the assembly. God gave the prophets and their prophetic words to instruct and encourage the people based on his word, none other. There are similarities between prophets of the Tanakh and the Brit Hadasha, which we call the New Testament prophets. Both spoke the word of God to the people. They both warned of judgment. Both spoke on current issues and both could predict the future on how the body of believers should react as Israel, as a nation, and in the New Testament, the church as a body, as a core mandate, was to be witnesses of Messiah and nothing to do with personal goals or desires. In short, let me summarize this. If you go to a church where somebody prophesizes over you about matters of the secular, your personal prosperity, whom your son or daughter would get married to, a new job. I would clearly say that this has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit. The ministry of the Holy Spirit, according to John 14, is to speak the word of truth, which is the word of God. Anything outside the word of God is false and is not from God. When you hear an utterance which is in prophecy, it has to be connected with the ministry of the assembly, which we commonly call the church, not an individual who is told that he would go abroad or he would do well in a sports event or anything like that. That has nothing to do with the ministry. And this is purely demons inspiring the person to prophesy something from the dark realm. Let's look at Acts chapter 11. We find Peter in prayer and a vision of a sheet came down from heaven, which confused him. But to his surprise, he was taught to take the gospel to the Gentiles through that revelation, through baptism of fire. In the same chapter, a man named Agabus arises in the midst of the assembly and prophesies about a word famine which then led the assembly to gather food supplies for the brethren in areas where food would be scarce. These two instances have nothing to do with personal goals and are just a few of how the Ruach HaKadosh inspired people through the gift of prophecy, as well as Paul and Silas, who called out the girl with the Kundalani spirit of the python in Acts 16.16. 16. All these prophetic revelations came to benefit the body of believers and nothing to do with the person. I will conclude part 4 here and part 5 will begin shortly. Welcome to the final part of Necromancy, Witchcraft in the Church. In the last part, we read from the New Testament about Peter and Agabus as well as Paul and Silas who through the gift of prophecy were able to discern what was of God and what was demonic. An examination of those that are deemed as the Laodicean church, their world of entertainment is postulated as worship. Let me say that again. The clear way to identify the Laodicean church is that they present entertainment and call it worship. The altars have been desecrated with podiums of self-adoration and worship of self, as mentioned in Romans 1, where they, the masses worshipped the creation rather than the creator. Self-appointed prophets are coming out of the woodwork like termites in a rampant hunger of adoration which is the highest form of blasphemy and desecration, also called by the prophet Daniel as the abomination of desolation. 
where man sought worship in the Holy of Holies, clearly in the place reserved for the Almighty God. When COVID-19 hit the world, the entire world went into a tailspin. Many believers were forced by their governments to take a vaccine that had not gone through the proper clinical test of over two years, resulting in the deaths, serious changes internally that would affect many thousands for the rest of their lives. So the question does beg how a man who exalted himself as a prophet, one above others, never saw this coming, not only to a nation but to himself, and almost died. In fact, they had to take him to four different hospitals because he had come that close to death. But today has the gift to convey the outcome of a sports event, as well as to inform a lady in the midst of a large church gathering that he has the gift to tell her the color of her undergarments. That is your Laodicean church, brothers and sisters. One has now to contend that vulgarism is not of the Ruach HaKadosh, but that of debased entities that guided Sodom and Gomorrah to their demise, as that is the zeitgeist of this age one that is there to seduce the carnal mind, remove the spirit of conviction and repentance for a handful of silver in order to betray that they knew not their creator anymore, but gave in to the lusts of the flesh as their minds were seared for all eternity. Just as that perished from the fires of sulphur that reigned during the days of Lot upon the cities that mocked the Lord God of heaven. The headlines of the Zambian false prophet who lives in the United Kingdom, who did not know that for three years Al Jazeera was recording and filming him on issues of international money laundering and gold smuggling, clearly proved that he is not from God, but speaks from the prompting of familiar spirits. This is something that's very common in Africa called Juju. As Juju is a part of African culture, immersed in the consultation of demons, which is necromancy. Did not the Lord himself prophesy about false prophets in the last days? He did not speak about teachers or pastors, but he said, be careful of false prophets. As a brother of the Lord would say in James 3.12, Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, either a vine, figs, so can no fountain, both yield salt water and fresh. No prophet, my brothers and sisters, who is involved in the ministry of the Holy Spirit, will get involved with money laundering, gold smuggling, or had the vulgar audacity, the vulgar audacity to state in front of a church assembly that he has the gift to see through a woman's clothes and tell her the color of her underwear. This should make you not only run, but to know that this prophet, this church, this assembly is from the kingdom of darkness as it has to do with the lust of the flesh and not the Spirit of God. The New Age, from the age, from the era of the 70s, was called the Age of Aquarius, and it's here, where deception is taking over the nations globally. The Commonwealth Games in the United Kingdom, as well as the Paris Olympics, showcase the agenda of Europa and Zeus for the world to witness their display of audacious displeasure towards the Creator God. This era is packaging Hinduism with the New Age mantras of the LGBT and woke unity and universal love, questioning the very existence of God and the Bible. They work in different secret avenues of deception. One 
which was developed by the famous occultist Aleister Crowley and the head of the Church of Scientology, Ron Hubbard, who were involved in many a mind control program, one which the CIA as well as the shadow governments have adopted called MK Ultra project, which is signified by its users as well as its initiates with the monarch butterfly sign. Let me repeat it. Anybody who is involved with MK Ultra, this is a project of mind control, you will see them displaying the monarch butterfly. The other visible sign of this program in Western music is the display of renowned artists covering one eye, which signifies the eye of Horus. Former witch of America, Elaine, documented by Rebecca Brown, did reveal how the deep state, which is governed by Satanists, planned the One World Order or the Nuos Seclorum Order under the guide of their god Lucifer. One, all 33 degree masons accept as the great architect of the universe. Moreover, the New Age doctrine covers areas such as Christ consciousness, which is a realm, not the person, who is the Son of God. Attachments such as medallions, bracelets with colored stones are used in Reiki healing, which is another branch of Hinduism and occultist practice, attached to the wearer, to the realm where they believe God exists. But in its dire reality, is the realm of the devil himself, followed by the yoke of demonic possession of that individual. That's all it does. You wear one of those colored stone bracelets and in next to no time, you will have a familiar spirit attached to you. These will all come together in the mark of the beast in Revelations 13, 16 to 17. And by that time, my brother, my sister, it will be far too late to repent and to recant. Finally, the latest movement is in the West is called Christ Consciousness through the practice of Prana Yoga, which focuses on people in a group or a church who come together and sit in a lotus position and focuses on their inner energy of the spirit person, where this is called the Prana Force where they claim originated from the sun. And that, my brother and sister, should ring a red flag, as this is the Egyptian chief god, Amundra. Pranayama is one of the eight limbs of yoga and is intended to expand consciousness awareness of prana, the inner energy. Nothing to do with the Ruah HaKadosh, the spirit of God. The scriptures tell us that Adonai breathed into Adam and he became a living soul. Not by might, nor by power, but by my Ruah, says the Lord. Not energy from the sun that the Lord himself created. Moreover, as a saved believer, we have the Ruah HaKadosh as our baptism, our point of baptism, the entrance of the Ruah HaKadosh into our lives. And thus says the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth, about the new believer and how much they are in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 2, 14 to 16. But the natural man received not the things of the Spirit of God. Clear distinction, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritually judged all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Messiah, Yeshua the Christ. Therefore, my brother and sister, if we have the mind of Christ, according to the Apostle Paul, why is the preacher asking you to wear a piece of jewelry and get into Christ's consciousness, where the scriptures confirm that we now have already the mind of Messiah? clearly proving to you the false teachings of the one that becomes conscious of a heavenly realm by wearing a bracelet when the word of God clearly, clearly states that as God himself says we are in him 
as a part of his body. Question, if we are a part of his body, how much more conscious are we supposed to be where we are? Yeshua said, I am in the Father and he is in me. So the question begs, was he not conscious of being in the Father when he said, or was it an oxymoron? No, my dear brother and sister, the scriptures are very clear that we are a part of Messiah and are already seated in heavenly places according to the book of Ephesians. There lies no more argument except a false doctrine being presented to delude the believer in giving up his wealth and eventually his soul to a false prophet who scripturally should be stoned to death. To conclude, my dear brother and sister, if your teach leader is teaching you about Christ consciousness, wearing bracelets or attachment with colored stones, medallions, selling oil, or even if you witness the image of the monarch butterfly as their signage, these are outward ensigns of the group involved in the occult, as they are openly advertising this fact as to whom they are associated with, which is the demonic realm, and you and I need to run away as fast as you can, just as Joseph did with Potiphar's wife. I will conclude part 5 here and part 6 will come shortly. Welcome to part 6, the concluding part of this study. I will end this teaching with my favorite psalm, Psalm 84, verses 8 to 12. O God, Lord of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear. O God of Jacob, Selah. Behold, O God, our shield, and look upon the face of thine anointed. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory no good thing will he hold from them that walk uprightly. Brothers and sisters, I really believe that in these five segments and the concluding segment six, that you have learned to discern where you are, those whom you associate with, whether they are really the body of Christ, or really a body that is following a false prophet who is under the instructions of a familiar spirit called demons. As the Sami says, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my Lord than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. The tents of wickedness, dear brothers, are gatherings where people do things which the prophet Daniel, as well as the Lord himself says, are an abomination, the abomination of desolation. The word of God says, for the Lord God is a sun and a shield. Look, just examine these two words. He is a sun, he is the powerhouse, as well as the shield to us all. Just imagine. Looking at God and saying, well, to connect to you, I need a bracelet, a colored stone. When the Lord said, I am going and I will send you the Paracletos, He is the spirit of truth. He will teach you all things. For those of you who have experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you and I well know that when we pray in tongues, we speak directly to God, not via stones, bracelets or any other attachments just your spirit and the Holy Spirit. And therefore, my brothers, I pray that not only do you listen to this message and are edified by it, but that you educate others and warn them of the perils that are faced through necromancy, witchcraft in the church. May the Lord bless you and guide you. May the Lord have his face shine upon you and give you his shalom shalom in Yeshua HaMashiach's name. Amen.